Hi, I'm here uh, talking with Ed Young, uh, who um, and probably more than most certainly uh, brought a lot of attention to the long COVID situation early in the pandemic. Um, and so, Ed, I, thanks for joining me. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I was curious, um, from the piece that you wrote a couple of weeks ago uh, in, in the New York Times um, about your experiences, just sort of starting to um, get this long COVID thing, that it wasn't just about the acute infection. It sounds like you first got an inkling of that from your sister-in-law, from what I gather, and then from Fiona Lowenstein and patients writing uh, opinion pieces and so on. Was that how it started? Yes, absolutely. I think it was a confluence of a lot of different things um, in March and April of 2020. Um, so yes, my sister-in-law was the first long hauler um, in my life. Um, the first time I recognised someone who got sick and was not getting better. Um, and there were, of course, a lot of pieces from patients themselves. Uh, you mentioned Fiona Lowenstein, uh, Mara Gay, uh, Felicity Callard, who all wrote um, wonderful Mm -hmm. uh, and illuminating blog posts about their their experiences, which just seemed to be to run counter to the conventional narrative that you either were extremely sick, like ICU sick, or you got better after two weeks. Um, and you know, I think enough of those pieces built up that I realized there was a story there. Um, it really helped that groups like the patient-led research collaborative already existed and had already, um, you know, done surveys of their own community. It was really helpful that things like body politic um, existed at, at the time, um, because you know so support groups were were already there. You could get a sense of the numbers of patients. You could, yeah, there were ways of um, getting in touch with people who were having these experiences. Um, so, so yeah, it, it was, uh, it, you know, I, I think I, I was just um, uh, collecting and paying attention to all of these signals that were emerging at roughly the same time. Now, one, one of the things is, as you know, for, in, in retrospect, is everybody in ME world um, knew this was likely coming. So as yes. soon as the, uh, the news of a pandemic, uh, you know, came about, everybody you know in, in, in wrote pieces or you know blogged or whatever in the world that you know i've been in it for for a while mm -hmm. um about that we're going to see uh you know post acute patients with prolonged symptoms that are non-specific and they're going to be told that they're having psychiatric issues or uh, anxiety depression and so on and so forth and that's exactly what happened why do you think that the rest of the and, and even though there's obviously a lot of data on previous pandemics, people were really unaware of this. Why do, why do you think that was? Um, you, you know, I, I think uh, it, it will not be. Um, I will not be saying anything new to any listener of this interview that um, ME has been neglected for the longest time. Um, its sufferers have been dismissed and gaslit. There is very little funding in going into uh, research and, and therefore uh, not a huge community of researchers who are well versed in the ins and outs of that condition. Um, you know, I, I think, as you say, rightly, um, patients and, and advocates in that space predicted the rise of long COVID once um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus started spreading around the world. But many, when I first started trying to um, write about long COVID, many of the academics and clinicians I know had no idea that this, um, either about long COVID or that the possibility of long COVID uh, was a thing, you know, that, that viral infections could lead to these months or years long consequences. Um, you know, one, one very good person who I talked to told me that it was very rare. Um, you know, actually one of the only clinicians I, I, I spoke to who had an inkling that this this could happen was uh, Craig Spencer, who mm -hmm. had Ebola mm -hmm. and was very familiar with the long term consequences of an Ebola inf infection. And I, and I think, you know, th there are there are certainly a few people who who have um, a, a sort of connection to this world who who were a bit more savvy. But in, in the main, yes, the 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 patients saw it coming, um, the the ME world saw it coming. And that, I think, should be a massive, uh, like, you know, uh, it should ring alarm bells for the medical establishment, for the journalistic establishment. It, it should um, uh, offer, I think, a, a severe dose of humility. Um, you know, and, and I think one last thing to say on this, I had 
um, I did not know very much about ME before I started reporting on long COVID. I, I knew very little, but I did have a, a small toehold into this world because I, one of my good friends, um, Sarah Ramey, um, has ME and wrote uh, an incredible memoir called The Lady's Handbook to a Mysterious Illness, which I read and blurbed and, and spoke to Sarah about. So I, I knew some, I knew a little bit of this. And very specifically, Sarah's book taught me about just what an ordeal patients with this category of illness uh, go through, um, how hard it is for them to get care, uh, both personal or medical. And I think that primed me to see the long COVID story in a very different way mm -hmm. once I started talking about those, seeing those signals that you talked about. Well, I think you're talking about sort of the secondary effects of not being believed on top of having an illness that that is devastating. And you have the secondary effects of nobody actually believing you and then sending you off for psychotherapy or for um, exercise therapy. And right. I don't know, I experienced sort of a, when I first was doing this, the secondary hit of that as when I would pitch editors, I could practically hear their eyes rolling in their heads when I would pitch something about chronic fatigue syndrome, as it was then more likely called, because nobody could get any traction and so it was interesting that in the long COVID situation it doesn't you probably did did you have any resistance i guess from editors or from covering this in the way that you were able to um which you might have had had it been a previous era where everybody wasn't facing this i guess so i think i was fortunate in having um very very good editors um you know i i uh, Brian Anderson edited my very first long COVID piece. Sarah Lasko is is my primary editor and edited all of my pandemic pieces after the the first few months. Um, and I think they are both very kind, very, very thoughtful people who are not the type to dismiss, um, you know, extreme social and psychological suffering. Um, they, they are not eye rolly types. Uh, and Sarah in particular, you know, n knows, has people in her life who have ME. So, you know, again, that, that, the, the, some and kind of personal critical. connection to, sorry? That seems critical uh, for people um, to know somebody. I also got into it because I had a friend who got sick in the 90s and I never really understood it, but I also knew that he wasn't just kind of making it up. I mean, it seems to be critical for people to know somebody uh, who they know is not, you know, is, is actually sick. Uh, yeah, it, it does. You know, it, it does seem to have, um, it does seem to be a very common thing. Um, you know, I, I remember asking um, in David Petrino, one of the um, uh, most prominent clinician voices um, in long COVID, um, why he so readily believed the patients who were coming to his doorstep rather than turning them away or dismissing them in the way that a lot of doctors do. Um, you know, and he said that um, his, uh, I, I I think that he won't mind me saying this because I think it's in one of the pieces, but his his wife has Ellis danlos syndrome, which is yes, one of the... She, yes, she said that, yeah. Um, and, you know, s similarly, a lot of the, the clinicians who work on ME, um, many of them know someone who has ME or have had and has had ME themselves. Um, I, I think it it does help and it's that sort of a sad situation, isn't it? Like it's it's um that unless you are personally affected or know someone who is, it's hard to extend the full force of your empathy and understanding to to this community. And I, I you know I, I've thought in, about that and wrestled a lot with that since um reporting on long covid and you know I, I think partly there's there's many reasons for it right there's there's all the societal reasons that i've talked about at, at length that um right. you know uh, our very entrenched uh attitudes about ableism and uh, make it very hard to comprehend an illness that it's so that so takes you out of the productivity race. Um, you know, our, our concept of disability, let me, let me say a few things here. So, so the, our concept of disability is, you know, something that is permanent, not something that is erratic, um, something that is very visible. So, you know, think someone in a wheelchair rather than someone who is 
um, crashing on, you know, for, for days or weeks, but might seem normal or other at other times. Um, much of and and, you know, uh, sexist attitudes in society make it very hard, make it um, uh, more likely that women's pain is disbelieved and these illnesses disproportionately affect women. But, let's, but I think let's 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 make sure that we make that point. I'm glad you made that point because sometimes that that point gets overlooked. That these are these the long COVID, MECFS, autoimmune diseases, things that are hard to diagnose often are disproportionately affect women and often are are gendered that way and I think get dismissed because they're coming out of the hysteria uh, mindset or the hysteria framework um, uh, from the past. So I think that's thank you for mentioning um, the the gendered aspects of it. Um, yeah, yeah, and wait. So, so one more, one more thing here. Um, yeah, go ahead. There are those aspects of it, those like grand societal um, biases that lead to difficult conditions for this group of patients. But, but I think there's also the fact that th- th- what people with long COVID and ME and and other related illnesses go through is so out of the ordinary of like our day our healthy normal experience it's so completely unlike what a healthy person would go through even when healthy people get very sick that it it's it i i think it it almost invites disbelief and a lack of comprehension and then there's the fact that you know these illnesses bring with them a litany of symptoms including things like fatigue, post-exertional malaise, brain fog, you know, other cognitive impairments that make it really hard to explain to people what is happening. So not only do you have something that seems unbelievable, but you struggle to explain what that means to other people. And and I think that's that also is part of why um, those secondary effects, as you say, are are so common. And I think therefore why journalism especially from healthy abled people is so crucial to I'm sorry, to sorry. show others what these diseases are really like it's interesting because i've constantly gotten assumptions you know i'm i'm a journalist and i'm also an academic i've constantly gotten the assumptions that i have me or i have a loved one who has me none of which is true right. I've been just yep. fascinated by the neglect of this and by the horrible research that's been done. And I'm glad you mentioned David Petrino because he's a good example of someone who really has learned because I, you know, I talked to him and he never heard of really post I mean, basically the idea that exercise can be or exertion can be bad for you um, and can exacerbate things is counterintuitive to most people and most clinicians, um, as is the idea that of post-exertional malaise. I mean, I think many clinicians and most people have not heard of PEM, uh, you know, even though they've presumably had patients who have it, I think I'm, so I'm curious when if you had even heard of PEM, post-exertional malaise, as a, as a, as a characteristic of illness before this all came about. Um, I I had and I hadn't right. So I I have I had read um your work. I'd read Julie Remire's work. You know, I'd read Sarah Amy's stuff. Like so, I I kind of but not in a way that really stuck in my head you know I, I wouldn't say going into my first piece on long COVID that I had a very clear idea about what this was and I, I think honestly it wasn't really until the last piece I wrote on, on long COVID about fatigue and it's it's what, what that word mean actually means mm-hmm. that I I truly grasped the difference between even the extreme fatigue that many long haulers face and what post-exertional malaise actually is Mm -hmm. and just just how qualitatively different those two things are it's like there is normal fatigue which is what i get when i you know stay out too late or work out too hard or drink too much or whatever or get jet lag and then there is the extra kind of fatigue that someone with long COVID or ME might experience like on the regular. Mm. And then this, there's PEM, right? And and these are different states that I think took a lot of work um, for me to tease apart. And you're, you're right, they are, PEM especially is, is unfamiliar to most people. It really, uh, it really goes against our, 
traditional attitudes about exercise being good for you, attitudes that are, you know, in, in the main correct, except for the group of people who have this particular condition. And I think what's really interesting is, you know, th there's so um, there's there's a group called Long COVID Physio um, that I, I really respect. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's folks like out. I did an interview with them. They just have a book out uh, a couple, few months ago. Oh, fantastic! I, I didn't know that. So yeah, you know, folks like um, Daria Oller and and um, and and others. So you know, there are a large long COVID is is enough of a thing that there is a group of people whose entire professional life revolves around exercise and using it as a therapeutic tool. Who now have long COVID and are now recognizing and saying, in this context, if you have PEM, exercise is bad. And was and I, I think the, the really fascinating dynamic here is because they are now patients with these neglected illnesses, their expertise gets dismissed too, right? Like you more you would you should think, I certainly think as a journalist covering this, like, well, here are the perfect sources, you know, people who have understood this world deeply, who have used it in their careers and are now you know have this epiphany because of their own personal experience that in this context exercise can be damaging right. so we should listen to them above everyone else like we should we should prioritize what they're saying we should pay very close attention to what they're saying and and it just seems that there are people out there who who th the minute they get sick they get lumped into this bucket that's um you know that that's people who are uh not objective can't be believed can't be trusted narrators of their own experiences and it's b bullshit uh, and it's so damaging and so frustrating to watch it happen in that way so ed i've been watching this happen for years and i was going to sort of end my project at one point but then long COVID happened and i started seeing the exact same people i'd spent years writing about their horrible research coming back and doing the exact same horrible research with exercise and you know whatever and the same kinds of problems with the research uh that one can easily point out so i thought well I, so so i guess the question that's always struck with me is that i can understand when there's sporadic cases of something people thinking well this person has something psychogenic or that's psychosomatic it's hard for me to understand on a worldwide level when millions of people around the world in different countries are experiencing you know similar things to then decide that it's sort of a, a psychosocial strain, as <clears throat> one of our American colleagues frequently says, or that it's <clears throat> psychogenic or that it's mass hysteria, as also been said. I, I don't really understand the mindset that looks at what's going on, this worldwide natural experiment, and decides all these formerly hardworking people who can't work are a victim of mass hysteria. I, I just don't, I, I'm finding it hard to grasp why how that happens. Do you have any insight into that phenomenon? Um, I, I also struggle um, to understand how it happens, but you know, I, you can, you, I think we can take some guesses. Um, I, I think that at to at one level, long COVID is so, you know, and Emmy and all the rest just run counter to our expectations of health and you know how how a body is meant to work, how infections are meant to run their course. Um, they go against a lot of medical training because a lot of people, are, um, you know, a lot of health clinicians are, are not taught about these illnesses. Um, and, you know, if, if you, it, it feels like it took work for me to understand what long haulers are going through. It took um, a lot of care. It took a lot of careful listening. It took a lot of interviews and, it took a lot of time mulling over the implications of those interviews, and they are they are grim. You know, it is it is hard sitting with the experiences of this patient population, and you know it it feels like, and then if you and but and then right like I have very few, um, sit, sitting with that costs me in an emotional way, but it doesn't like upend my. Um, like my professional understanding of the world as it might someone who is trained in medicine and I think if you if you have to grapple with that you know I can I can see why people 
might just tap out and take the easier option, which is just to discredit the entire patient experience. Now, I think that is an, um, a ludicrous and, and actually, frankly, a moral proposition. But like, but I think that's part of it, right? Like it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it's almost like it takes too much work to, to, um, to accept the reality of what these conditions mean. I think it's probably, I mean, you, you suggested this also, people are very invested in their research and their life's work. And so if you spend 20 or 30 years promoting, um, you know, as a professor of psychosomatics, and you see this, you're going to have a hard time uninterpreting everything in the way that I think it is, is <laughs> interpreting it, I guess, in the way that I see it. Um, as opposed to the way that you're trained to see it, as you suggest. Um, of that... course. And, and and also, you know, so we can talk about me both medicine and journalism, right? So, so medicine, you are you are trained under this famously grueling training regiment. Um, you you end up thinking um, that you are that it, it self selects for a group of people who are extremely confident um, and who have been told that they know a lot about how the body works. Um, they they have to be very quick and decisive. Um, and, you, you know, I, I think that that creates a situation where, um, where people might very easily discredit a patient's experience. You know, where you it, it's it's almost like you're you're self-selecting for a pool of people who are going to trust their own received expertise over what they are hearing, um, you know, across the uh, examination table. Um, and then, you know, with, with journalism, we have a similar kind of problem, right? Like we, we are, we, you and I are trained to sift through evidence and make sense of large reams of information. And, um, you know, to, to have that ability challenged to, to be told, um, you know, actually maybe you were paying attention to the wrong information maybe you've done this badly maybe you've uh, you know prior prioritized voices who you shouldn't have that's very jarring and destabilizing too like you know to, to really grapple with what long covid means um requires people in both of these professions to ask hard questions about their training the the their institutions like the society in which they live um and that's not that's not easy work it's it's uh, i would say yes it's been it's been challenging and i'm wondering if you've gotten um what i've gotten a lot of which is whenever you challenge whenever you say these are you know you, we, there, there are seem to be pathophysiological dysfunctions um for these illnesses you get accused of either denigrating mental health or denigrating people with mental illness or engaging in mind body dualism all of which i find to be sort of absurd arguments because I certainly haven't denigrated mental health or anything like that. And I, but that I'm wondering if you sort of seem to get those same kinds of charges when you write your stories. Um, yeah, sure. You know, I, I've seen those criticisms before. Um, and honestly, I, I don't particularly want to spend too much time today, like going in, going deep into them. Right. And, and I don't, because I, 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 I think there is off that in in many situations there is a little to be gained in letting the extremists dictate the terms of engagement and obviously that is that is part of what what one has to deal with in this space because that has long been true but you know we are in a space i think where where changes offer um i i feel it um you know that large organizations around the world have um uh, acknowledged the reality of long covid um you know there's there's more talk about um it and about me and about though all of the illnesses in that cluster than i think there there has been for years you can tell me if you, you feel otherwise because you absolutely it's true the, it's it's been amazing to to have me become something that's written about uh, and usually, of course, it's written about in the context of long COVID, but it is amazing to see so much attention paid to these illnesses uh, as such a change from when I first was starting this. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, you know, I see um, I, I, there are obviously 
you know, there are obviously going to be skeptics. There will be bad papers published. There will be bad um, pieces of journalism published. But I, I think that if we spend all our time just playing whack-a-mole with that and the arguments within, we, we don't get very far. I, you know, I've tried by comparison to... Um, you know, write pieces that actually explain what the ex what the patient experience actually is like, like what it means to have post exertional malaise, what it means to go through brain fog, what what it is like to um, have your medical uh, credibility questioned if you are a clinician who ends up with long COVID, and and I think those kinds that kind of work is what I. I'm prioritizing because I, I think that they act as conduits for empathy rather than, you know, starting from the frame of this is widely disbelieved and here are all the reasons why that's not the why that's not true. We're we're just saying from the get-go with these pieces, these conditions are real. They're sometimes contested, but we can put that aside. They are real. Here's what people are going through. I, I feel like that gets us a bit further and you know I, I think that i see more of that coming out i see more learner institutions uh you know co coming round um i i think that uh, i think that just you know some some long haulers have argued that just by sheer dint of numbers, by by the number of people who are experiencing long COVID and therefore the number of other people who like me who do not have long COVID, but know people who do, um, we, we, we're entering a world in which the reality of these kinds of illnesses will be harder and harder to dismiss. As you say, you know, the, the, the psychogenic whatever becomes much, much harder to, to argue when you have hundreds of thousands or millions of people who can very loudly talk about, you know, who, who they and their allies can very loudly talk about what their actual experiences are. Uh, and I think that's the, the world that we are moving towards I, th I think you know there's still a lot to be done but th that that in itself is is a reason to hope and and a reason to I think um you know pu push forward with the kinds of stories and the, the kinds of um uh changes that we want to see uh you know without getting drawn into that whack-a-mole thing I think it's important. I, I I think that's those are, those are good points. I I do think though the, the problem is that these people are still getting papers published, and I think it's important to point out when they're published how subpar many of them are. Um, sure. One of the issues that I that I find very troubling is is the degree to which um, policy decisions are made based on these unblinded studies with just relying solely on subjective um, outcomes. Um, which I think was not something I was so focused on before I got into this whole thing, but that we, there's so much research that's solely based on open label studies. So everybody knows what the intervention is. And then the end result is just, how do you feel? Which is, you know, really just a, obviously a recipe for a lot of bias. And so, so many of the studies of long COVID ME are just that kind of study. And, uh, you know, just getting actual information from that, I find very, those are very unreliable sources of information, but they get published in the best journals. So I, there's a real, to me, uh, mismatch there. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I agree with that. Um, you know, I, I think it, it, this, this area trains you to um, look at sources of evidence in with, um, I think, a keener lens. Um, and, you know, I, I've said in some of the pieces I've written, the, um, you know, there's a, there's this famous quote in biology that um, nothing biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. It's a, it's a quote about the, the primacy of evolutionary theory in helping us understand the living world. By, um, co by comparison, nothing about long COVID or ME makes sense except in the light of the patient experience. Mm. And that's, that's the ground truth. That, so, that's what you need to understand first before in order to interpret the kind of data that comes out from a lot of the published literature. So are you, what, do you have any sort of final thoughts? We've gone on for about half an hour. So I think that's, uh, we've given people a lot to think about. Do you have any final thoughts you want to add? 
Um, I mean, no, I mean, we, can, we can we could talk about this topic for hours, right? It's it's rich. Um, I I think what's that the, what's the final for journalists? So let's talk in the journalism domain. What what's the lesson for this that you would offer journalists who are covering covering these these areas? I think um, treat patients with respect and with care and treat them as the experts that they are, not just in their own lives, but about their illnesses too. Many of them truly know a huge amount um, about the underpinning scientific literature behind their their condition. Um, and, uh, you know, I, th I think a lot of the... Um, a lot of the norms in our field work against us here. Um, you know, tight deadlines, um, phone interviews can be crushing for people who have, um, you know, who have long COVID, who have post-exertional malaise. Um, do um, um, journalists love iconoclasts um you know they love the the person who uh was told that they were wrong by the establishment and, and you know fought their way through to to acceptance and i think a lot of the uh like emmy and long covid skeptics the the voices who keep on saying that this is all psychogenic and so on get to get a lot of coverage because they trigger that particular instinct um you know, I, I think that we we often prioritize, we often uh, gauge expertise through credentialism. Um, you know, I for a lot of my pieces, I look for sources who work as professors in august institutions. Um, that instinct uh, is often great, serves us very poorly here. Um, because it often points us to people who actually know not that much, uh, and certainly less than patients, advocates, carers, family members, like all, all the rest, right? So, um, you know, there's, there's so much I could say about this, about seeking expertise where it actually lies, rather than where we, we uh, you know, we, we are trained to believe it lies. But I, I think underpinning all of it is, is an ethic of care um about realizing that you know we're often taught that journalism it, it's often said that journalism is about speaking truth to power it, it is about you know holding uh uh holding people accountable that is all true but it is there's a, an easy hop skip and a jump from that to just being an asshole, right? Like that speaking <laughs> truth to power means that you must be antagonistic, that you must be um, brusque and even cruel, um, that you can do whatever you like, um, but uh, and it doesn't matter because that's how you maintain your independence and your, your integrity. I, I think that's nonsense. I, I think that um, this is a great example where to do our work effectively, we need an ethic of empathy and care and compassion. And that the result of that work can be truly profound um, and aligns journalism much more with caretaking professions. Um, you know, the, the, the pieces that I've written about long COVID, many of them have given readers who have these conditions or care for people who do, solace um, and peace and a sense of validation and, and recognition. Um, you know, it's... Um, I found that to be so rewarding in terms of doing this work for the last number yeah. of years, because especially before long COVID, when so few were writing about it, I, I did get that constantly and it would sometimes just make me cry because I just, people were so you know, feeling so left alone and so on their own devices and just having somebody who's not sick say, oh, I see you, I understand, you're right, I can I can see your suffering is, is such a thing. And it's really something that you've given to so many people uh, that I, you know, that have told me that. So I, I, you know, as we end this, I sort of want to thank you as well for that on, on not, you know, on, on behalf of others who, who've told me how much your work has meant to them. Because um, I, I do think the visibility has been uh, that you've given us has been amazing and so helpful uh, in terms of moving this this whole thing forward. So thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, talk with me today. 
Thanks, David. I appreciate you and your work too. Um, take care and um, good luck with everything. Thank you. I appreciate it.